Hi, this is the lecture video on spring force. So spring force is covered in section 3.6 of your textbook. And as far as the description goes, it's uh, complete. Spring force describes restoring force. It's uh, proportional to displacement. And um, there's even this uh, graph of how spring force depends on the displacement. And this slope is what we call spring constant. And there's a single example here, how stiff are car springs, that describes how you can relate the applied force and the displacement observed to spring constant. So that's what's in your textbook. And it's complete as far as the what uh, absolutely needed goes. But some of you might find that this coverage a little bit too sparse and perhaps a little bit too mathematical, especially for introductory class like ours. So I thought I would make this video to provide you with some visual aid and help build your intuition for springs. So in a face-to-face -face class or a lab, the best way to do this would have been through lecture demos and lab exercises. But since this is an online class, let me use this simulation to help build your intuition. This is from fatphet.colorado.edu. It's one of their new simulations called Masses and Springs. So let me go into the vectors tab that will help me illustrate everything I want to illustrate. So this is the simulation. And if you have seen springs before, this simulation behaves like a real world uh, spring would behave, except I guess this is oscillating too much. Uh, uh, I, I think I can just uh, make it come to a stop there. <laughs> so there it is. Um, this is the mass on a spring. When I pull this mass a little bit, this spring oscillates. And hopefully all this seems familiar. It doesn't seem all that unnatural. And what I want to use this simulation for is help visualize our description of the spring. So to start is the spring constant or the stiffness of the spring. And I can illustrate it by hanging two different masses on these two different springs of the same spring constant. So I hang a 50 gram mass there and 100 gram mass there. Let me make that come to a stop. And you see that 100 gram mass stretches the spring more than the 50 gram mass does. And in fact, if we are a little bit more quantitative about it, you can observe something interesting. I am going to put a line here so that I know how far I am displacing the spring. Here's the how far the spring stretches with the 50 gram mass, about eight centimeters or so. And here's how far the spring stretches with a 100 gram mass, about 16 centimeters or so, or about double of how far the 50 gram mass stretch the spring. As you hang different amounts of mass, you realize that how far the spring stretches, about 40 centimeters, is proportional to the amount of mass or amount of weight, so the amount of force you are exerting on the spring. This is the origin of the spring constant. To balance the five times the amount of weight, gravitational force, you need five times the amount of spring force. And to get the five times the amount of spring force, you have to stretch it five times. We can visualize this a little bit better if we enable the forces vectors, gravity and spring force. Mm, let me move the ruler a little. So in both of these cases, the two springs are at equilibrium. What that means is the net force on them is zero. And that's because the gravitational force pulling down the mass is exactly balanced out by the spring force pulling up on the mass. And for the larger mass, in order to provide this larger spring force, the spring had to stretch more. So that's comparing two identical springs. Now, 
I can flip this around and hang two equal masses on both sides. So I hung 100 gram masses on both sides. And right now they look identical because they're the same springs, same mass, so same weight and same spring force and same amount that it stretches by. Now let me change the spring constant of the second spring so that it has a larger spring constant. What that means is the spring is stiffer. And with the stiffer spring, watch how the spring stretches less. But time, note how both masses at equilibrium, the forces are the same. So the spring force that's on this 100 gram mass is the same amount of spring force as on this 100 gram mass at equilibrium. It's just that with a larger spring constant, it takes less displacement to achieve the same amount of force. So we can calculate the spring constant in each of these cases. So for both of these cases, the gravitational force is given by the amount of force on this 100 gram mass or mass times times. I'm going to use the approximate value of G about 10 meter per second squared. Then that's equal to about 1 Newton, 0 0.1 kilogram times 10. So there's 1 Newton of gravitational force on these two masses, which means the spring force is at the same amount because the masses are at equilibrium. So spring force has to be equal to the gravitational force so that the net force will be zero. Then what we need to do is measure the displacement. For this original spring here, the displacement is about, let's say, 16 centimeters. For this stiffer spring here, Let's say that the displacement is about 10 centimeters. Then Hooke's law says that the spring force or the magnitude of spring force is a spring constant times the displacement or working it out for the spring constant. Spring constant is the magnitude of the force divided by the displacement. In the case of the original spring, the spring constant should be 1 newton divided by 16 centimeters. And let me work out the numbers on the calculator. It's 0 0.0625 and the unit is newton per centimeter. When you are given spring constant, watch the units carefully. Sometimes you might be given in terms of newton per centimeter, which is sometimes more convenient. But in the basic SI units, it would be Newton per meter. So you should watch out for the unit of length. Make sure the unit of length you are using for measuring displacement matches the unit of length that you are given elsewhere. In the second case, with the displacement of 10 centimeters, the spring constant is same force, 1 Newton, divided by 10 centimeters. This I think I can do in my head. 0 0.1 Newton per centimeter. Watch how this number is larger than this number. And this is the stiffer spring. So larger value of a spring constant means stiffer spring. So this is a lot of calculation and I promise you won't have to do it too often in this class. It is conceptual physics after all. But this is something accessible within what you are expected to be able to do in our introductory class. All right, let me wrap up with the last thing we cover in chapter three, which is looking at the net force when the mass is not at equilibrium. And I am going to add one more line for mass equilibrium that will help me talk about being away from equilibrium. And there's a comparison I want to do later. So let me make spring constant to 2, same as the spring constant to 1. Um, oh, and let me pause the clock so that I don't have to deal with oscillations. All right, so this mass is right now at equilibrium. What that means is when if I look at the net force, the net force is 0. I can move it away from equilibrium by pulling it down. Notice how as I pull it down, the gravitational force doesn't change 
because that's just mg but it's the spring force that's changing it increases as the displacement increases and the result of that is that now there's an upward net force and if i displace this mass the other way so instead of pulling it down more i push it up a little bit then there's now downward net force and that's a result of the spring force decreasing while the gravitational force remains the same. So someone might ask you the question, let's say you have a mass at equilibrium and somehow it comes to equilibrium and the question would be, what is the net force on the mass if you pull it down some more by some amount? Let's say in this case, 11 centimeters. And here's an interesting thing. So if someone were asking you about the spring force, then you have to know the total displacement all the way from beginning to where it is now. But if someone's only asking you about net force, then all you have to know is the additional displacement from equilibrium. It's a very convenient accident. That's a result of the spring force being linear in displacement. In other words, by starting from the equilibrium, you've already accounted for whatever spring force you need to get the mass to equilibrium. And all you need to know is the spring constant and how far is the additional displacement to know what is the additional spring force which gives you the net force. And once you have the net force, then you can calculate things like acceleration and anything else you might be interested in knowing. Now let me look at one more um, interesting thing, well interesting to me. I am going to hang a 250 gram mass on the other spring. So they have different places of equilibrium because as we went over this is heavier. Now I am going to pull them down by the same amount. Watch how the net force appears. So let me pull them by uh, 16 centimeters. All right, I think that's close enough. Let me uh, measure it with the ruler. So this is about 16 centimeters. And this is about 16 centimeters. All right. Watch how for both of these masses, the net force is the same. It's because the amount of displacement from equilibrium is the same. Now they have different amount of mass. So if you look at the acceleration, their acceleration will be different. And if we let the clock run, it will undergo an interesting kind of motion, which we'll look at later in Unit 2. Uh, it's called simple harmonic oscillation, and it's a type of motion that describes many different phenomena. But for the purpose of Chapter 3, um, I just want you to have some familiarity with the spring force, that amount of uh, spring force is proportional to how far the spring is stretched, and that this uh, relatively simple relationship leads to a lot of very interesting types of motion. Um, so until next time, bye.